Hey guys, welcome back. So in this video, I'm going to be doing a, a complete set of measurements on a new horn that I've designed. It's the ES2000. It's the smallest bi-radial horn that I've designed to date. And so you can see here, a uh, new feature is it has pockets on the back for foam. And the idea there is that the sound wave coming around the, the edge of the horn gets absorbed by the foam. And so that's the idea. And what I would like to do is test this horn with these three compression drivers and then put it in together with this mid-range horn and try to uh, see where the best crossover point is. This horn is a 600 hertz horn, two kilohertz uh, horn. So using the, the two together. And so what you would typically do is have a bass cabinet that plays up to 600 hertz, and then you would have a mid-range horn and then the high frequency horn. And so the crossover points would be around 600 hertz and around, let's say, five kilohertz. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, uh, you'll see on your screen there, we're gonna start and I'll show you some of the resulting acoustical measurements for the compression drivers. So the three compression drivers that I have today are, this is the brand new BNC DE360. It uses a ketone polymer ring radiator. The BNC DE120, which is now discontinued, it's been replaced by the DE110 and also they released another uh, same family of compression drivers. Uh, it's the DE111, which uh, I'd be interested in testing out, but I just uh, purchased this one uh, for testing because um, the Audio Express test bench did a test on this compression driver and it actually looked like it had no breakup, even up to 20K, which really piqued my interest. Anyways, uh, the third compression driver here is the RCF ND350, which um, I've had for maybe a year now. And I've had this one for about five years. And like I said, I, I just purchased this one. So the uh, way I'm gonna do the measurements, I'm gonna do full set of each one. I'm gonna do off axis, polar maps, distortion sweeps, frequency response, and then I'm gonna look at the step response as well. So let's get started. So on the DE360, um, you can see there on your screen, I did a dis uh, distortion sweep. And you can see that it has actually quite flat response uh, from one and a half kilohertz up to 10 kilohertz where it actually has a falling response. I was hoping to use the DE360 as a, as a super tweeter, you know, 5K and up, but doesn't look like it's going to be suitable uh, because of the there's about a, a an 8 dB drop from 10k up to 20 kilohertz. So um, a bit disappointed there, but you can see the uh, distortion is quite low. So we're just hovering around 0.1% uh, for the total or it's the um, the second harmonic distortion, and then the third and the fourth harmonic distortion is. Uh, below 0.1%, which is actually quite respectable. So um, if you are used to seeing distortion sweeps in terms of the decibel scale instead of percentage, there it is there. So you can see that we're uh, 58 dB down uh, on, on that from the fundamental. So now looking at the uh, frequency response, um, this has been set to the, the uh, nominal 60 dB scale on the vertical and you can see there it's incredibly flat uh, plus or minus 1 dB uh, from one and a half kilohertz up to 10 kilohertz and again there's a bit of a disappointment there with the the falling response now I did try to EQ that up a little bit and see if that would help um, but unfortunately uh, it didn't really respond too well to that so Looking at the burst decay, you can see that it has an exceptionally clean uh, burst decay with no breakup whatsoever in the upper treble, which is, um, you know, it's quite an accomplishment uh, for a compression driver, but I, I suspect that is to do with the, the ring radiator, which doesn't have the, the big broad dome shape that it has to um, keep pistonic. So the ring radiator um, has an advantage there. So 
Moving on to the step response, we can see that the step response was actually quite long. So it's three milliseconds before it finally settles. And so you'll see uh, in these, with these other compression drivers leading up to that, that, uh, that that is twice as long as the others. So moving on to the off-axis polar response for the actual horn. So you can see that we are getting a uh, really well-behaved off-axis and it's providing really wide coverage right up to 20 kilohertz. So you can see that we are 90 degrees uh, coverage window at 20 kilohertz with this horn. So um, that was what I was after with this particular horn is to provide that extremely wide sound stage. So moving out to um, what I found was is that I normally measure out to 60 degrees off axis. With this result, I decided I should move out to 90 degrees to kind of give you an overall, more of a bird's eye view of, of what the polar response is. And you can see there it is very well behaved with a nice gradual narrowing of coverage as you move into the upper treble. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, really kind of um, straighten out in the upper treble. And so that's good. And so you can see there as well, I've, I've just put my uh, settings for Arta, which is the measurement program that I use. You can see there, if you have the same software and you want to try to do your own off axis measurements, then you can replicate the same settings to do an apples to apples comparison with the results that I'm getting. So, um, okay, so I, I just wanted to discuss my subjective impressions on this driver. So when I first tested it, I, I just actually listened to the to the driver um, in, in the system and um, I was really kind of disappointed to be honest. So um, I wasn't hearing a lot of transient um, snap to the highs. It was a little hazy and um, I've heard better. So it caused me to measure the frequency response and, I, and that's when I discovered the the significant falling response past 10k. So like I said, I tried to EQ it, but uh, the end in the end, it just wasn't what I would consider like an audiophile uh, suitable for audiophile applications. So um, which made me question, well, is it the horn or is it the compression driver? Because, you know, this is a new horn. So that's what led me to test these other two compression drivers to see if, you know, we had a problem with the horn or if it was the, the compression driver. So what I'd like to do is we'll move on to the DE120 and uh, show you some of those measurements. So you can see there, this is the distortion sweep for the D B and C DE120. And you can see it's not quite as flat uh, through the bandwidth as the DE360, but we are actually getting full treble extension up to 20 kilohertz. So, um, and then also worth noting is that the distortion uh, is very similar to the DE360. So um, the frequency response there, you can see it with the 60 dB scale. Um, we're plus or minus 2 dB from about 3K up to 16 kilohertz. So still respectable, okay? It's not, not as good as the DE360, but still very, very respectable. The burst decay, um, also very respectable, but you'll you will notice that there's um, some breakup starting at around 16 kilohertz. So, and to be honest, looking at that breakup, it is fairly significant. So um, there's also a little bit of ringing at 10 kilohertz as well. So, um, but um, the step response, if we look at the step response, then we can see actually that it's only uh, one and a half milliseconds. So it's only half the uh, the the time to uh, fully fully settle. So um, off-axis polar response. So I decided to measure the off-axis polar response with this driver as well. And the reason being is because I I know this driver quite well. I've I've physically measured the throat, and I've found that it's 28 degrees conical, uh, 14 degrees on the half angle. And so this horn is actually designed specifically for the DE120. However, I, I simply assumed when I was designing it that the DE360 would be the same throat angle. 
that wasn't the, the case when I got it. Um, looking down into the throat of the DE360, it's, it's, it almost looks parallel. It almost looks like it's zero degrees, which is disappointing. Um, and then to top it off, it has a bullet in there. Um, so it's just, uh, whether that's contributing to the flare rate, it's, it's not an aggressive, uh, flare rate at all. So I remeasured using this compression driver, which will literally have a perfectly smooth transition in the throat. And so you can see there that the polar map is actually uh, better on, on when you're using um, the right compression driver. So you can see that from 10K up to 20K, it has an even more gradual, um, more well-behaved off axis than the, the, with the DE360. So, and again, moving out to uh, the full 90 degrees off axis, you can see that it genuinely has a very nice well-behaved off axis. So, I'm, I mean, it's, it's pretty much textbook perfect um, and I'm not using any smoothing or anything like that. So um, subjective impressions for the DE120 is that it's definitely better uh, than the 360. And um, yeah, it's, it's a step up. And I would be really curious to hear the, the DE111 that recently came out that has new, um, they say they use FEA on the motor technology and, and that. So um, next I'd like to do uh, the full set of measurements on the D or the RCF MD350. Okay, so different brand. Um, this is a little more pricier driver. It has, you know, some serious copper in the motor to reduce intermodulation distortion and so you can see here the distortion sweep the distortion is pegged right at 0.1 percent which is which is excellent um moving to the db scale if you're more familiar with that it's it's right down there like it's over 60 db down from the fundamental which i i'm fairly certain that with these measurements i'm simply at the noise floor of my test equipment or my microphone or whatever it is so um i i no matter what I try, I can't get below that certain distortion level. So um, it, what I'm saying is, is that the, the ND350 might actually be lower distortion than that. So, um, and then, so here we have the frequency response measurement and you can see that it's fairly flat, certainly manageable. Um, so it would be plus or minus uh, 2.7 dB uh, from about 1K up to 18 kilohertz where you can see that it falls off quite sharply after 18 kilohertz. Uh, burst decay, so you can see there that um, it's it's also a very clean burst decay. There is breakup, which this is using a 1.7 inch diameter diaphragm versus the, the 1.4. So even with the larger diaphragm on the RCF, the breakup is actually starting at, um, at around 18 kilohertz, where the DE120 is is at 16 kilohertz so and and then even at that the breakup at 18 kilohertz is not nearly as uh as dramatic or as bad as as what we're seeing as on the de 120 so step response you can see that the step response is 1.6 milliseconds so it's very comparable to the 120. listening impressions um so the d the RCF uh, was, it exhibited the best sound quality of the group. So it has razor sharp uh, detail and a really, um, it's very smooth. And, um, and so it's certainly past that threshold for what would be considered an audiophile type driver. So it definitely meets that performance target for audiophile applications. So I'm very happy with this. Um, so the next part of the test is, you'll see there, this is the Autumn Series. Um, it's a small type of three-way that I've developed. So that's an eight inch driver that you see there. So the idea with this Autumn Series is that you can mix, mix and match different components, different bass cabinets with different horns. And so it's meant to give you that horn uh, speaker sound quality, but in a, in a smaller size package. So typically horn speakers are, are massive, which they do need to be big if you're trying to get down to low, low, low frequencies. 
However, if you want to have the, that sound quality in your listening room, then what I've created here is a smaller uh, size format. So it will horn load uh, down to 600 hertz using the mid-range horn. And so what I've done here is I've used active, uh, an active equalizer or DSP to just kind of pick a crossover point and using the ND350 with the ES2000 with the horn. And then you can see there, um, I picked a 24 dB um, Linkless Riley slope. And you can see there, I, I was able to get a pretty respectable flat frequency response there at the five kilohertz crossover. Okay, and so you can see there in the picture, this is uh, what the overlaps look like between the high frequency and the mid frequency. So I didn't apply any EQ. And so just a little bit of a backstory. I wanted to find a solution that would be a very simple 24 dB 5K crossover because I've, uh, I'm wanting to look at using active uh, electronic crossover for five kilohertz. And so without having to have any kind of contour circuits or anything like that. So that's something that I'm also investigating is a fully active uh, electronic crossover, which I'm currently testing out. So, okay. So then looking at the burst decay results for the two, the, the mid horn and the high frequency horn, you can see there that it actually gets very good results. You can see that through the mid range, it's very clean uh, burst decay result. And so the idea here is that you match the off axis polar response of the, of the two, two horns. And so I found that 5K basically produced a seamless polar map and you can see it there. And so um, the only real thing that you see happening is that you do see the narrowing in the upper treble from 10K up to 20K. So the only, the only way to really get away uh, from that narrowing would be to go with either constant directivity type horn that has very wide coverage, but I find that it's very hard to find a constant directivity horn that actually produces, you know, very even, well-behaved off-axis through its entire bandwidth. It's usually, there's a lot of uh, compromises there. So um, the other option would be to go with a smaller throat, you know, instead of this, this, the one inch throat that this uses, is use a half inch throat, which will give it even wider coverage in the upper treble, which there's not too many compression drivers available that have that that small of a, of a throat. So I've just decided there, if you see on the screen, I've, I've put other ways of displaying the off axis response, just to kind of give you a full appreciation for what the, the per measured performance is uh, with this combination using a 5K crossover. So pretty seamless. I mean, it's a pretty much impossible to tell where one takes over the other. So, um, so that concludes this video, um, I will say that once I did have it set up and um, we had, I was getting very, very coherent, very, the, the intelligibility through the mid range, mid range was excellent. And uh, there was, I was using it with just one speaker set up, but I mean, there was really wide sound stage and depth to the sound stage as well, which you know that you've achieved something when there's sound stage depth with just a single speaker, right? So. Um, so that's, it's, it was good. So, um, there you have it. So new, new, new room, uh, for my videos. Hopefully I'm going to continue doing this type of format. If you, if you, um, have, if you like it, leave a comment and, uh, click the subscribe button. So take care. Have a great day.